Okay, welcome to Robotics One. Fortunately, today's lesson is an easy lesson. So, I just want to let you know that it's an easy lesson. And the information, it's mostly information. And we will talk about the sensors and actuators, but wanted to discuss this topic because the next topic, which is on motion control, would utilize some of these components. We could have some sensors, we could have some actuators like DC motor, we could have a hydraulic or pneumatic actuator. And at that time, we have to do some dynamical modeling. So it might be a good idea to get some theory information, some theoretical background uh, in this chapter. So when you talk about the actuators in robots, lot different types of actuators are used. You could have a linear actuator. So basically the motion is forward and backward or you could have a rotary actuator. So you could have rotation. There could be electrical actuation. It could be hydraulic actuation. It could be pneumatic actuation. So you could have DC motors, AC motors. So you could have DC, AC, or you could have stepper motors or you could have servo motors, you could have linear motors. Uh, in the case of hydraulic, you could have piston cylinder assembly. So cylinder, piston assembly. It, you could have uh, motors, in the case of pneumatic actuators, you could have rotary turbines, you could have actuation. So this chapter kind of gives you an overview of different drive systems. So in this chapter, we are going to talk about electric motors, hydraulic actuators, pneumatic actuators, and the where they are used what are their advantages and disadvantages? How do you select a particular actuator? This chapter will not go into the detail of mathematical modeling of these actuators. Next chapter, which is on motion control, we will study how to come up with the, the equations, or dynamical equations of motions for some of these actuators like DC motors, and electrical uh, systems. So the, the idea be behind selecting appropriate actuator is you want that actuator to be quick to respond. So which means the time constant has to be low. You want that actuator to be super efficient. You don't want a lot of power to be consumed in actuation. So you, do, you want friction to be minimum. You want actuator to be compliant at the same time stiff. You want the actuator to be rigid so that it does not bend, but you want actuator to give a little bit when there is some deformation uh, you want to compensate for. And then power to weight ratio for actuators is very important. Now, in the case of hydraulic actuators, it's the highest electric motors, it's medium and power to weight ratio is lowest for the pneumatic systems. And stepper motors, they are used everywhere. For an example, if you look at the 3D printers in Innovation Hub, the 3D printers are powered using a stepper motor. Stepper motor run in open loop. So there is no feedback so we will talk about open loop and closed loop systems. Now, one thing is uh, 
quickly note the difference between the stiffness and compliance. Stiff systems are more rigid, but they and they do not deform. So that, that is the reason why they are more accurate. So in other words, if you have a stiff robotic arm, that robotic arm will not shake or will not vibrate. It will maintain its shape. But you also want to make sure that under load, that robotic arm is capable of giving up a little bit because if there is a sudden drop of the weight, you want that energy to be absorbed in the robot arm. If that robot arm is super stiff, then what will happen is if all of a sudden there is a shock load, then rather than that energy getting dissipated, the robot arm would simply crack and you don't want that to happen. So you want to add selective compliance either at the, the frame or at the joint. Many a times what we do is we actually use reduction gears. So what we have is we have a drive gear and we have a driven gear and the speed of the driving gear is N1, speed of the driven gear is N2, N1 is significantly greater than N2. So N, which is the reduction ratio, is nothing but N2 divided by N1. And the reason we want that is reduction in speed gives you increase in torque. So torque and speed, I just want to give you this simple example. Think about power. Power is given as torque multiplied by speed. So this is torque and this is speed. So if you have a DC motor that is maybe running at 10 watts, but it is rotating at 10,000 RPM. So if the DC motor is 10 watts, but running at 10,000 RPM, and if you have a huge reduction ratio, if you have a huge reduction ratio, what you can do is you can get amplification in torque. Because check this out, T1 omega 1 is equal to T2 omega 2. As omega 2 drops down, value of T2 goes up. And that is why we use the gear or reduction ratios. Now, this gives you a list of or the bullet points for comparison of hydraulic actuators. So usually they are used in large robots, highest power to weight ratio, then they have low compliance, but you need additional subsystems like accumulator, pump, filter, and so on. You need hoses. The system could leak. So that is the, the advantage and disadvantage of hydraulic actuators. On the other hand, if you look at the electrical system, usually they are good for all size of robots. They do not leak. They are spark free. There is low stiffness, but you have to be careful about designing the control system because you will have additional effects like backlash, reduction gears, and so on. So you need to be aware of the dynamics and your controller should be able to control the system appropriately. If you have a pneumatic system, uh, pneumatic systems are usually lightweight. The air pressure is low, but again, you need uh, a sort of a compressor, accumulator, you need a filter. And then unfortunately it has lowest power to weight ratio. Now, hydraulic actuators, there are there is an equation that you should be remembering is force is equal to pressure multiplied by area. So if you add some pressure, pressurized fluid, then that pressure multiplied by area is going to give you the force. And if you want to find out the flow rate, flow rate dictates the speed. So for an example, if the flow rate is Q 
q is equal to area times velocity so if q is increased the area of the actuator is usually constant so velocity gets increased these are the different components of hydraulic system you could have all the way from actuators to sensors to filtering system to pumps and then I, if you think about a hydraulic system the the braking system in your car or the power steering system in your car is a hydraulic system the hydraulic system typically looks like this is something similar to your power steering system wherein you have an actuator as you turn your steering wheel additional force is provided by the actuator and there is actually a servo valve that controls the amount of fluid and the flow or the flow rate of the fluid so that the steering is smooth so you will have power unit you will have return valves you will have a, a controller you would have some sort of displacement measurement sensor for pneumatic devices uh, it's very similar the only thing is usually the air is discharged into atmosphere so unlike hydraulic system wherein you have a central tank where the hydraulic fluid such as oil is stored in since in case of air you would just have a tank that is at high pressure but once the air uh, does its work it's exhausted to atmosphere and leakage usually is not a problem now electric motors you are familiar with electric motors there are different types of electric motors like ac dc stepper motors you have direct drive and brushless dc motor the idea or the principle behind electrical motors is very simple imagine if you have permanent magnets north and south and you have a current carrying conductor a current carrying conductor inside a magnetic field experiences force and if you look at the way this coil is oriented there is a component of force going up and a component of force going down that causes this central coil to rotate this coil is nothing but the rotor of the motor there is a concept which is called as commutation c o m m u commutation now you have commutation that makes sure that the direction of current is reversed in 180 degrees because to maintain the continuous rotation in the same direction in the pneumatic system you can control the flow so you could have an orifice that would control the flow of air so it is possible to control the speed in the case of pneumatic system as well so you have concept of commutation in dc motors that allows you to change the direction of current every 180 degrees that commutation is not an easy concept to grasp so i strongly recommend that you watch the youtube video on commutation in dc motor because what happens is once you have current flowing through the conductor the way the diagram is drawn when that conductor this conductor becomes perpendicular when this conductor becomes perpendicular the force stops and you don't want that to happen and the only way to make this conductor rotate continuously is to reverse the direction of current going to the conductor that make sure that you have continuous rotation so you have brushes and then you have commutator that will actually make sure that uh, you have a change in the direction of the current now speed control is quite important and in the case of ac motors usually ac motors run at constant speed there are two types of ac motors you could have an induction motor or you could have a 
a fixed uh, stator type of motor where you have uh, uh, a magnet in in as as rotor and we will talk about it so dc motor the speed control is achieved by changing voltage or current ac motor you have frequency and number of poles that change the speed in dc motors you could have brush dc motors or you could have brushless dc motors and heat dissipation ac motors can dissipate lot of heat so nowadays if you look at the motors that are used in your air conditioning units your pool pump they are mostly ac type motors how do you how do you uh, see if I mean, uh, looking at the motor, how, how can you decide whether the motor is AC or DC? Typically, AC motors would have capacitors, start cap and run cap. Those ensure that there is a phase difference that is needed for the rotor to start rotating. So that is super important. Now, in uh, heat dissipation, AC motors can supply a lot of uh, uh, power and clearly because of the power requirements, they have to dissipate a lot of heat and they are capable of dissipating a lot of heat. Now, if you look at the heat dissipation path for the AC and DC motor, usually what you have is you have the air gap, uh, then you have permanent magnets and the body, all these components, they act, they, they, have, they transfer the heat. Uh, and again, in AC motors, the heat is, majority of it is generated not in the rotor, but it is, is generated in the stator. Now, heat generation in motor, is typically the function of uh, I square, the current of passing through the coil uh, multiplied by the resistance of the coil. So you typically have I square R losses. And again, you could have change in the resistance value as the winding uh, gets heated up because of the resistance. Now, strength of the magnetic flux, unfortunately, is negatively affected by heat, which means if the motor is running hot, then the effective power or effective torque that is generated, that gets decreased. That why, that's why you will see a lot of times these motors on the same shaft at the end has a fan, and that fan actually flows air over the motor coils. So, so to dissipate the heat. Now DC motors, they are very commonly used. They are reliable. The stator, and there are two types of DC motors. You could have a permanent magnet DC motors or you could have electromagnet DC motors. So in the case of permanent magnets, you could have rare earth magnets or neoblenum magnets that are inside the stator and the rotor is coil, and then you have commutator, brushes, uh, contactors that pa they pass the current through the rotor. And then because of the electromagnetic interaction, the rotor starts rotating. And commutation is really needed to change the polarity, so change the direction of the current so that the rotor continues to rotate continuously in the same direction. If you look at the the torque characteristics the torque characteristics of the dc motor is given as kt divided by r v kt square divided by r so if you look at uh, this equation you would notice that as the voltage changes this is actually omega as the voltage increases the torque provided by the motor increases. But as the speed increases, the, the torque decreases. So basically, you have this torque equation that is used 
to find out the relationship between the speed and the torque and the voltage. Now, there are many types of DC motors and you can uh, look at different types. There are pancake type DC motors. Uh, there are some exotic DC motors that are used in specialty applications. But depending upon the requirements, you can choose DC motors that have power, torque and speed characteristics that you need. Now, nowadays you can, you have something called as frame motors and the frame motors are something similar to the hub motors that you see in your hoverboard, wherein the motor is part of the structure, which means if you look at the, the, the wheel, the, the stator, it's actually the stator is rotating in the hub motor and that, that the tire is mounted on the stator. So basically you can have motors integrated in the part of uh, the structure. AC motors, AC motors, you could have a permanent magnet, AC motor, wherein the rotor is a permanent magnet, uh, which is also called as synchronous motor, or it could be a squirrel cage. And that really looks like a squirrel cage. And if you want to look at different types of AC motors, completely open, I would encourage you to go to Peralta Hall. And in Peralta 109, you would see uh, lots of motors completely bare bone. So you can actually pull some motor chassis out and look at how the motors are constructed. They don't have any external enclosure. They just have plexiglass cover. So you can see those motors and you will see that how those motor windings are constructed. And then you can see the commutation. You can also see the speed control schemes for different types of motors. Brushless DC motors, if you are into RC cars, then you are probably, or RC airplanes, or, uh, or the uh, rotor crafts or quadcopters. You probably are aware of brushless DC motors. The biggest advantage of brushless DC motor is absence of brushes. That gives them long life. And uh, basically they act as similar to AC motors and you would have a phase control. So you can actually control the PWM using uh, some sort of a PWM controller that would control the electronic speed control that actually controls the speed of the brushless DC motor. And brushless DC motor, yeah, usually they have three wires coming out, it's a three phase. So what happens is electronic speed control takes a DC voltage and then converts that into an alternating varying voltage that is continuously supplied. And then that is how you can actually energize the winding and that causes the rotor to rotate. Now you can also have, it depends upon the motor design. The important aspect is efficiency. If your motor is efficient, then despite of the same size, uh, it will consume less current for the same amount of torque. So motor efficiency is important factor. But AC motors, because of their ruggedness uh, and simple construction, almost no maintenance are widely used in consumer applications. However, if you look at, uh, unfortunately, the precision motion control with AC motors is not possible. So if you, are, if you look at the CNCs, or if you look at the, the precision control robots, they will use DC motors. In the direct drive DC motors, they are similar to brushless DC, and they can deliver large torque at low speeds and basically they are used in specialty applications. In servo motors, the idea is you have, servo motor has a feedback. 
Now we will talk about different sensors. So say you have a DC motor, I'm gonna call this a DC motor. And I add an encoder at the end. So encoder. So, and what I do is I get the input from the encoder to a controller. And this controller controls the speed of the DC motor. So this is a controller. So this becomes a servo motor. And again, it doesn't really have to be DC motor. If you have an AC motor, and if you have a very sophisticated controller, control of AC motors is not that easy. So if you have a sophisticated controller, then watch, and if you add an encoder to it, it can also act as a servo motor. But feedback is the key component of servoing. So whenever they say it's a servo, usually it means that you have some type of sensor that is measuring the output of the motor. It could be the displacement, if it's a linear motor, it could be rotation, it could be if uh, using encoder or resolvers or some, some other sensor. Now, this is again the torque versus speed characteristics of servo motor. And I want you to notice that the schematic of a servo motor. So here, what you see is this is an encoder. And encoder has actually, if it's a Hall effect type encoder, it will have five wires. And this is the control, uh, the, the actual motor wires. And if you look at the schematic, you will have a feedback system. You would have uh, the external load that could be just uh, a reciprocating load or rotating load or some, some external load. And what you do is you come up with a transfer function or equation of the motion of the motor and use a controller algorithm to control the motor. And we will talk in detail uh, about different types of controller algorithms. What do we mean by proportional, integral and derivative PID control? Then we will talk about pole placement. We'll talk about root locus, different controller schemes that are used for motor control. Stepper motors, again, these are quite cheap, commonly used. If you look at your 3D printers, almost all the commercial 3D printers, consumer grade 3D printers have stepper motors and stepper motors usually have a drive circuitry. And the principle of stepper motor is very simple. There are different varieties of stepper motor. And depending upon the application, you would use the appropriate type of stepper motor. So how does a stepper motor work? In stepper motor, you would have a ferromagnetic core. Say for an example, you see the core over here. And what happens is you have stator with coils. Depending upon what type of motion you want, you energize the coil. So in this particular case, the top coil is energized to become North Pole and the bottom coil is energized to become the South Pole. So the rotor gets aligned where North to South uh, combination is achieved. So think about it to begin with, if this rotor is at uh, arbitrary position, then as soon as you energize the coils, the rotor will get aligned. Then what you will do is, you will excite the horizontal coils. So the rotor would now get aligned horizontally. If you were to excite both the coils at the same time, then you will realize that this rotor will be in between. You could achieve a micro stepping, whereas the rotor the, can actually micro step. It's not a full step. Uh, so, and you can actually have this uh, external coils energized in a proper sequence, you could make this rotor run very fast. So what you will do is you will in sequence energize these pairs of stator coils that would make sure that this rotor is rotating from zero degrees to 45 degrees to 90 degrees to 135 degrees uh, 
to 180 degrees and it will continuously rotate. Now, sometimes it could miss a step and that is also possible. So if the, the rotor dynamics is uh, preventing of, if all of a sudden, the, if the rotor gets stuck or rotor encounters a lot more resistance than that it can overcome, then you could have uh, issues in stepping and rotor could miss a step. Now, can stack motors wherein you have uh, north-south poles aligned on the rotor? Stepper motors are not. Stepper motors are open loop. So this is very important and you have to understand this. Stepper motors are open loop. Servo motors. is closed loop. Stepper motors are cheap and servo motors are expensive. And if you have a brushless DC motor, if brushless DC motor does not have a feedback, if brushless DC motor does not have a feedback, there is no way to control the motion of the brushless DC motor. So, but if you have a brushless DC, if, if you have if you have brushless DC motor with some sort of encoder or some sort of feedback, then you could you can achieve a precision motion control. But with a stepper motor, the good news is even though they are running in open loop, usually based on the microcontroller excitation pulse signal, you can fairly easily control the number of steps. So you can have that motor go from zero degrees to 10 degrees to 15 degrees to 40 degrees. But again, that is purely running in open loop. So stepper motors can be used for the robotic applications, but for precision robotic application, you would always use servo motors. Now, if this is one way uh, a stepper motor is constructed, so you can see the rotor with multiple north-south poles and you have stator windings and here you have a lot more stator windings so you can have a finer resolution. Now, you could have a hybrid stepper motors wherein you could have uh, two independent windings, you can have a center tap, you can have a permanent magnet rotor, you could have a ferromagnetic rotor. So there are lots and lots of variations in stepper motors. And you can actually see uh, information online that will talk about different types of stepper motors and their applications. So how, do you, how does a stepper motor work? So in the case of stepper motors, uh, what you wanna do is if you want to use them as calipers wherein you want to have ultra precision linear motion control then what you can do is you could have alignment of divisions and the alignment of divisions that is dependent on the linear motion so and the magnitude of the flux and the excitation dictates whether you are going to have a, a micro motion or a macro large motion and that way you can use hybrid stepper motors for uh, linear motion. And then you can actually use different type of switching schemes. If you want to have full step or half a step, and that again depends upon the type of controller and the microcontroller that you use. Usually you, you will have a stepper motor driver, a dedicated integrated circuit that is capable of driving stepper motor and you can actually uh, write a microcontroller program you could have an arduino controlling the stepper motor driver and the stepper motor driver is in charge of energizing particular winding or uh, de-energizing particular winding there are again various uh, differences between the unipolar, which has just one winding, bipolar and bifilar stepper motors. So you could have 
uh, one power source, you could have two power sources, or you could have center tap stepper motor. And depending upon how the coils are connected with each other, how the coils are energized, the characteristics, power and torque characteristics of stepper motor, they vary. And there are different windings and some windings are shown over here, wherein you have a four lead winding, five lead winding, six lead winding, and you can energize them together or energize them separately. And that dictates how the stepper motor torque versus speed characteristic is going to change. For an example, in the case of stepper motor, uh, you would have the torque versus speed characteristic as shown in the picture. The plot shows the star, uh, torque versus speed characteristics. Good news about stepper motor is something called as the holding torque, which means you can actually stop the rotor of the stepper motor at some mid orientation. And as long as the strength of the magnetic field is capable of resisting the external load torque on the stepper motor, stepper motor will have hold torque. But unfortunately, as the speed increases, the torque developed by the stepper motor decreases. So for an example, in the case of 3D printer, what you want is you want uh, the lead screw to rotate clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise at different speeds. Stepper motors are perfect for that. So you can actually have the nozzle go up and down or the base plate go left or right. And you can have the whole thing in sync so that you can 3D print the part that you, you have uh, created. Speed reduction is an important aspect. There are various speed reduction devices. You could use gear train. For an example, you can use a planetary gear train or you could use some sort of uh, harmonic drive wherein you have a little bit of compliance uh, in the stator and rotor that actually creates significant reduction in uh, 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 rotational ratios. You have to be careful about different types of gears to be used. If you are interested in how to design different types of gears, uh, what are their advantages and disadvantages? Coming spring, I'm teaching a class which is called EGR 445. And in that class, I will talk a lot about different types of gears, how to design worm wheel, how to design uh, spur gear, design helix gears, how to design bevel gears what are their advantages and disadvantages. So we will spend a lot of time in EGR 445 that talks about the, the, the gear and different types of gear designs. Now, the next part is we are gonna talk about, uh, we will talk about the mathematics of gear reduction. Yes, it is offered every spring semester. Uh, in next class, but I just want to tell you there is another interesting device which is called as the harmonic drive. And in the case of harmonic drive, if you look at the stator and the rotor, uh, the, you have this sort of elliptical shape, which is, that is called as uh, the wave generator. Wave generator is sort of an elliptical shape that rotates. And be, as it is rotating through the stator coil, it kind of, steps back every rotation. And this stepping back causes a significant reduction in ratio, gear ratio. And it's very difficult to explain the principle of harmonic drive. But if you look at a YouTube video of harmonic drive, you will exactly see what happens as the rotor is rotating. Rather than maintaining the full contact, it actually goes backwards. And then the speed of the, the shaft gets reduced significantly. So harmonic drives are used in a lot of robotic applications. Uh, so these are the different types of actuators used in robotic systems. 
Any questions before we go to next chapter? Okay, so next chapter. Yeah, what's your question, Ba? Yes, there is a software to design gears. As a matter of fact, SolidWorks has a gear design plugin. Not only that, if you look at online tools, there are lots and lots of tools that will help you design gears. The, the input that you need for gear design is the reduction ratio, center distance, type of gear, perhaps uh, the power and speed requirements. And then if you have any constraint on the module, once the module is determined, nobody makes gear. gear so what you do is once you know what module of the gear train you need, you go on to MacMaster car or Granger or Amazon or some shop in China, maybe on eBay and buy the gears that are off the shelf available. Okay, any other questions? I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna go to the next chapter. Once again, this chapter is very theory oriented. So uh, in the past, student found actuators and sensor chapters to be a little boring because that information can be uh, uh, understood or found out just by watching YouTube videos. Uh, so I would strongly recommend uh, the functional uh, descriptions, watch the videos of different types of actuators, different types of uh, gear reducers, different types of gears, because that will give you a better understanding. If you look at the stepper motors, there are excellent videos on different types of stepper motors, how the stepper motors function, how the DC motors function. I would encourage you to watch those videos because a video is worth a thousand pictures. So in the case of sensors, uh, we, we use very many types of sensors and most of you are familiar with different sensors because you have used them as part of your project classes. There is a position sensor, uh, there is velocity sensor, there is force sensor, touch sensor, tactile sensor, proximity sensor, range finder, vision sensor. You could have uh, uh, sniffing sensor, test sensors, speech sensors, and so on. So the important characteristics that we look for in good sensors is size, weight, cost, what type of output is sensor able to provide? DC, AC, frequency, PWM. The other important uh, characteristic of sensor is a range. So what is the range of the sensor? What is the resolution of the sensor? And all that information is super useful when we select the appropriate sensors. Now, what are the important sensor characteristics? Sensor characteristics are sensitivity, which is the ratio of output to input. For example, if you have a weighing scale, you want to have some sort of relationship between the weight and the output. That output could be maybe the voltage or that output could be the mechanical motion or that output could be the, the ADC counts. So that is the sensitivity. Linearity means is output linear to input or output is nonlinear. So you want to have sufficient range. You want the sensor to respond quickly. It should have low time constant. Then the sensor should have bandwidth. For example, you cannot use a tire pressure gauge to measure the pressure inside an internal combustion engine because the, the internal combustion engine pressure is varying super duper fast. And clearly the tire pressure gauge 
does not have enough bandwidth to uh, to compensate or to get the measurement accurately now the next thing is reliability and then how do you how how reliable the system is do, does it give you the same output again and again for the same input how accurate the system is how repeatable the system is and you want to have a system which is accurate and repeatable accuracy means how close uh, is your reading to the true value and that is super duper important so next thing is we are going to go through some simple sensors so potentiometer most of you must have seen a linear potentiometer and the rotary potentiometer and what happens is they use they are proportional uh, to the distance or the rotation so the resistance changes and the change in the resistance is an indication of the displacement whether it's a translational linear displacement or whether it's a rotary displacement the other as uh, another important sensor is an encoder you could have an optical encoder or you could have a hall effect based magnetic encoder and you could have a rotary encoder you could have a linear encoder uh, and it produces some sort of an output based on either the translation or the rotation uh, of the the sensor you could have uh, absolute encoders wherein they measure the the rotations from 0 0 or you could have incremental encoders where they measure the incremental rotation from the previous step and they have their own applications so you can use um, uh, different types of encoders for different types of applications and again how does an encoder work if you have an optical encoder or if you have a magnetic encoder you would be generating high and low signal and usually you would have two channels and that would allow you to measure the rotational rate and with two channels you can actually measure the direction of rotation using encoder is super simple you could use a simple arduino to measure the encoder and find out the speed of the motor uh next semester we will have a lab assignment wherein we would be actually programming the encoder and designing the pid for a dc motor so in the case of absolute encoder you could actually have uh the absolute position starting from zero reference and you can measure the total revolutions and again you could have the encoder either in gray code or binary code so depending upon what system that you are using you can have a gray or the binary code but at the end of the day you would have a microcontroller that is deciphering these high and low signals and then you would have some sort of a, a program that you will write using maybe interrupts that would take this information and give you the speed or the position now the next important uh, transducer uh, that is actually used is L lvdt which is linear variable differential transformer so it, in this sensor what you have is this is like a transformer and what happens is you have a primary winding and you have a secondary winding but what happens is the core goes up and down or forward and backward well you can use uh, there are two types of encoders you can use the encoders for the linear motion or you can use the encoder for rotary motion so for an example if you look at the the printers a laser printer uh, or inkjet printer you would see that they have a linear encoder so they have an encoder strip to measure the linear distance so encoders could be linear encoder or they could be rotary encoder uh, 
it's not like encoders are only used for rotary motion encoders can also be used for reciprocating motion in the case of lvdt uh, output is a variable and that output is dependent on how much displacement the core has so you can measure the time and you can also use this information to find the velocity so the principle is super simple you have a transformer but in this li uh, linear variable differential transformer the core is allowed to go forward or backward and the advantage of that is uh, the output voltage is proportional to the location of the core and that can be used as a displacement measurement device you can also have resolvers so resolvers have two coils and what happens is you have the resolver rotor that is going to rotate and as it rotates you would measure the voltage out on the coils and what happens is depending upon the phase of the the voltages you can actually find out where uh, that rotor is it is similar to the principle of lvdt except instead of reciprocating core you have a, a rotary uh, rotor and then you have the coils and you can get the voltage out from coils that is proportional to the angular uh, displacement of the rotor now you can also use some sort of magnets Uh, to find out the linear or rotary motion, and that is where the LMDT or MDT uh, they come in picture. They are called magnetoresistive or linear magnetoresistive displacement transducer. The idea is very simple. What happens is you have magnets, and then you you have a conductor, and then when you send a pulse as soon as it reaches the magnet location it bounces back and the time of travel is measured and that is used to find the distance you could also have the hall effect sensors wherein what happens is the output of a conductor changes in the presence of the magnetic field so this change in the magnetic field is recorded somehow using a microcontroller and what you do is this hall effect sensor is used to measure the rotation in the case of brushless dc motor typically you have hall effect sensors to uh, to sort of provide additional feedback on the speed and the direction of rotation so usually in the brushless dc motor many a times you have censored motors and censor less motors so those censored motors have hall effect sensors global positioning system say if you have a rover and you want to find out its location with respect to a, a, a waypoint then you can use a gps unit that will tell you the location velocity sensors the encoders or tachometers can be used for a measurement of velocity and encoders even though it's giving displacement if you get the displacement information along with time you can find out the velocity tachometers again can work on different principles some of them work on the principle of magnetic induction wherein the electrical current uh, generated is proportional to the speed and then it's similar to a dc motor and then you can use that information to find the speed now what you can do is if you have a velocity sensor and if you want to measure the displacement you can run it through a differential uh, amplifier the differential amplifier is nothing but a simple op amp that is going to find out the difference between uh, the two successive measurements and that it can be used for uh, determination of velocity from position or you can use an integrator that can use the velocity signal to convert into position signal so you can have different configurations of op amps you could have a differentiator op amp 
or you could have an integrator op amp uh, using the RC resistance capacitive circuits and that would be useful to find out velocity from displacement or displacement from velocity. To measure forces, you could have piezoelectric sensors, you could have FSR, force sensing resistors. Uh, you could also use load cells, which are nothing but strain gauges. And based on that all uh, information, you can determine the forces. So strain gauges are based on a very simple principle that you have a teeny tiny wire. As that wire is deformed, the resistance changes, but the change in the resistance is super small. So you need some sort of amplification circuit. Typically a Whitstone bridge is used as an amplification circuit that will take the change in the resistance and give you a change in the voltage. This change in the voltage is proportional to the applied force. In the case of torque sensors, you could have multiple strain gauges that are placed at the strategic location. And what happens is as that uh, particular structure or cube that deforms, that deformation is related to the measurement of torque. Again, the fundamental principle is the equation in torsion T divided by J is equal to uh, G theta divided by L. Now I need to write this down. So you have studied this equation T divided by J is equal to G theta divided by L. And that equation is utilized to find out the value of torque. You can also use uh, touch sensors. In the case of touch sensor, you could have LEDs and light sensor that could indicate where the finger is. You could also have capacitive sensing uh, that will give you the touch sensing. So for an example, the screens of your iPad or touch screens, they are capacitive sensors. So as soon as you touch anywhere on that screen, the at that pixel, the capacitance changes and that is an indication of touch. There are capacitance to voltage converters. So that can be used to de uh, detect where uh, somebody has touched on that sensor. In the case of proximity sensors, the, the only purpose of the proximity sensor is to find out or whether something is close or not. So you could have an emitter and a receiver and emitter sends some sort of signal. It could be magnetic or optical. And then the receiver uh, takes the reflected signal off of the surface and then you can measure the proximity. You could also have uh, an ultrasonic emitter and an ultrasonic receiver wherein you send the ultrasonic waves and then we can find out the amount of time it takes to, uh, to get the echo back. And you can measure uh, the time. And then since the frequency of the speed of sound is known, you can find out the distance. Then you could have an inductive sensor wherein it, if you have a magnetic surface, you could use a magnetic effect and as soon as you have a surface coming close to that magnetic sensor, uh, the sensor triggers on. You could have capacitive sensor. You could have an AD current sensor. Uh, depending upon what proximity sensor you have. For an example, if you have an ultrasonic sensor or ultrasonic range finder, you may just need one sensor. If you have uh, for an example, uh, just a magnetic proximity sensor, then to find X and Y location, you need two proximity sensors. Then range finders, they could be optical, they could be uh, uh, ultrasonic, and the idea is you, or they could be laser. So LIDAR uh, that are used in driverless cars, they are also part of this to find hole on a surface. Usually to find the hole on a surface, what you do is 
you would use a single emitter and receiver it's just like a stud finder wherein you have an emitter and you have a receiver as soon as there is a stud there is a change significant change in the magnetic field around that stud and then you measure the the stud location and then what you can do is if you want and this is probably more relevant to your question bow if you are interested in finding uh, a location you can do it using triangulation and the triangulation means that you measure the distance using one sensor you measure the distance using another sensor and then you have an intersection where the object is located so this is the concept of triangulation or you could have a line of flight where you have a laser the laser beam comes back and what you do is you measure the time it took to reflect just like an ultrasonic range finder so it this talks about the triangulation principle wherein you have a receiver and emitter again you are going to send a, a emitter you could have two emitters or you could have the same emitter changing the angle and then you can measure the received signal at the receiver and you can use the trigonometric relationship to find the location for time of flight you find the amount of time it takes to get the signal back and then based on the speed that is known that is constant and you can actually find out the location ultrasonic range finder we just talked about it so you have emitter receiver and you measure the amount of time it takes for the sound to be reflected now these are the the range finders these are lidars they are typically used in uh, uh, driverless cars so if you see a, a google car or a waymo car you will have a big dome the lidar is running on the top you would have two small lidars on the side and two lidars in the back uh, if you have some experience with teslas nowadays they use cameras to do the range finding so it has multiple cameras and they find the same image and they use uh, the the triangulation from the cameras for determination of distances voice recognition typically used uh, using uh, done using the uh, signal processing and speech synthesis and this is a huge area of research and all of us are familiar with alexa siri google uh they have microphone they have signal processing then they run uh uh, uh inter artificial intelligence engines that can be used for uh, uh, determination of spoken signals and typically what uh, you do is you have continuous data coming in and you are training the neural networks continuously and that is how the alexa or siri becomes smarter the more you interact with with, with it and then the the idea is contextual sensing so understanding the context uh, or the the hidden meaning in the sentences and that is done by using based on uh, the large databases uh, and ai deep learning and neural network now this is something that is uh, sometimes used in positioning so what you have is you have a, a pivot and here so if you have an accurate alignment then you don't need a pivot but imagine there is slight misalignment so you want to accommodate for this misalignment so you would allow this pivot to kind of translate and rotate a bit and when you allow that compliance the assembly is easier and then uh, we are not going to talk about a whole lot in the rccs wherein you can use different types of mechanisms to ensure that proper assembly is done or if there is some discontinuity uh, in the motion you want to have some sort of 
a yield or give giving up in the robot joints so that the robot is accurately able to perform the motion i would encourage you to look at these different compliance devices that are used in assembly operations uh, and because of the tolerance tolerance stacks you could have slight um, uh, changes variations and these devices are allowed that they allow us to uh, compensate for those tolerance stacks or variations so with that we are done with uh, chapter 9 and chapter 10 and at this point if you have any questions i would be happy to answer okay travis you had a question does an oh oiler to rot okay. when you have code running in infinite loop most likely there is some error in uh, programming because yes asjad had the solution for the earlier homework and as discussed in earlier class if you email asjad he should be able to send you the solution